Beijing in with a one hour stop in Macau. Um, the mushrooming trade and investment between Taiwan and the mainland has been one of the most impressive developments. Uh, and it, it has caused uh, some concerns in the leadership who uh, follow both sides have been in favor of the increased travel. As you probably all know here, well over 100,000 travelers a month are leaving Taiwan and visiting the mainland. That is, uh, you know, well done. It's now one and a half million people a year. Uh, many of them, of course, going twice or three times or whatever. But uh, it's just an enormous flow of traffic. Most of it takes place through Hong Kong. Some of it is now going to be diverted through Macau. But these people are spending a lot of money just incidentally while they're in China. And the investment that's in China, uh, as you all know, is reaching astounding proportions. Uh, there are many factories in Guangdong and Fujian and now in other parts of China. A friend of mine who is a professor at the National War College, the U.S. Defense University in Washington, took a group over to visit China this past year, and one of the things that started it was he visited a shoe factory outside Beijing, which was run by the People's Liberation Army, but the two managers were Taiwanese businessmen who were, uh, who were actually running it. It's an amazing development. Well, one of the things the government has done in recent years so that, they would not, so that the country would not be vulnerable to a, a shutoff of this spigot by the people's republic should relations get difficult. So the government launched this southward policy encouraging investment by Taiwanese businessmen in Southeast Asia. It's been remarkably successful. It was going on anyway. And as I mentioned earlier, Taiwan is the largest or second largest investment in most countries in Southeast Asia. Now, what are the implications of all of this development for the United States? Uh, there are lots of business opportunities between the United States and Taiwan. Our council has been trying to promote, among other things, the idea that American companies should take a harder look at Chinese companies in Taiwan to form partnerships to do business not only in Taiwan and the United States, but also go together into China, go together into Southeast Asia. It's a... Uh, both sides bring a lot to the table. Uh, the Chinese companies in Taiwan know the Chinese culture, know how to do business in the mainland, have relatives or friends there, know the language, know the customs. They have capital. American companies, and they have the, the, their highly skilled labor in Taiwan, uh, trained engineers and uh, technicians. The United States has high technology. It has a worldwide marketing organization. Uh, and managerial and organizational skills to bring to the table, as well as some capital. So I'm hoping that more things are going to happen like this, but some of the major companies in the United States are using their subsidiaries in Taiwan to uh, go after contracts in mainland China, and it's working. They're not talking about it too much, but it's been a very interesting uh, solid development. And I hope that many of you in this room, uh, if you are doing business in Taiwan, We'll take a look at the idea of getting yourself another American partner here who could go in there with you. You may see an interesting role for your own business in this regard. You may see a role as an intermediary with another American corporation. But I hope you'll give some thought to it. I want to wind up these remarks by uh, addressing what I think is really the astounding accomplishment of, I, I haven't taken the time, which I would have uh, given a longer speech to go into more detail of how did Taiwan get where it is and the wisdom of the macroeconomic policy makers that you have there that have uh, guided the economy and the energy and brains of the Taiwanese businessmen uh, who have been the uh, engine for this development. It really is just astounding. In 1950, the per capita income in both mainland China and Taiwan was $50 a year. Today, it's uh, less than $1,000 on the mainland and over $12,000 uh, on Taiwan. Uh, so the comparative accomplishments here uh, are all too visible. And it's a lesson uh, that has not been lost on the leadership in Beijing. When the leadership in Beijing looks out at the world around them, what do they see? They see economic miracles in virtually every country in Asia, Korea, Japan, 
Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, and now increasingly in places like Thailand and Malaysia. When they look at those countries, three of them are ethnic Chinese, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore. So the message is not lost. It's not the raw material that's lacking. It's the system that is different. And many of the things that have been done by the leadership in Beijing to develop an open market economy and to uh, loosen the reins of central control have been inspired by what they've seen as they looked out and studied these other systems that were doing better than their own. So I think that what Taiwan represents with its economic accomplishments and its new democracy, with the election of President uh, Lee, if he's re-elected, or whoever's going to be elected on March 23rd as president, the first time in 4,000 years of Chinese history that a leader of a country, of a Chinese country, or a Chinese people, has been directly elected by the people. This is really an incredible historical accomplishment, and it pretty much is kind of a finishing, crowning uh, a gesture for uh, the realization of full democracy in Taiwan. This message is not lost on the United States or our leaders in Congress and the administration who is watching this problem with uh, great interest. And I think that Taiwan represents a beacon of freedom outside of the billion people, the Chinese people on the mainland. It represents an alternative way for all of them. It shows them that there is another way to live that can bring prosperity and freedom to a degree that they have not known in England. And I think I had an interesting conversation with President Lee uh, last April when I was on a visit there. I told him that I thought one reason the uh, the Chinese, that the mainland was so hard on them, more progress had not been made in the cross states talks, was that they considered it to be a closet Taiwan independence name. And, uh, you know, would he care to react to that? And he said, well, I, I've known President Lee for, for some time. He said, you know, David, people think of me as an economist because I uh, have a PhD in agricultural economics from Cornell, and I wrote a three volume history of the economic development of Taiwan. Uh, and I've had a, a certain role in the development of the Taiwan economy. But I've always thought of myself as a historian. And um, I've been a student of history, both Chinese history and Western history, since I was 18 years old. And I've been always been fascinated with the role of the Renaissance in Western culture, in Western history, and what this did to transform uh, the earlier culture into a more dynamic and aggressive thing. And I have had the idea, since I was 20, that there is going to be a renaissance in Chinese history, in Chinese civilization. And I like to think that we are starting here, and that is one of the roles of what we're doing here in Taiwan, is to spark the renaissance for the Chinese culture. And I think that that is the accomplishment that's already been made in Taiwan. And I take my hat off to the people there that have worked so hard to accomplish this, and to all of you who come from there and who play a role in its uh, continuing development as uh, business traders with uh, your homeland. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be with you.
much better than I, uh, my understanding of Taiwan. I, I don't even know that Kaohsiung Harbor is the uh, third la largest or the biggest uh, harbor in the world. And uh, as he said, uh, Taiwan did an outstanding job in the Taiwan development. And next year, well, actually this is the year, 1996, and in uh, March on the 23rd, we had an election of the uh, president. I hope that uh, we will turn out uh, smoothly, and then uh, uh, I hope we pass the message to the world that Taiwan should be recognized as a nation in the United Nations. At this time, I will represent the uh, chamber to present us a, a plaque for appreciation to our keynote speaker for his uh, outstanding and wonderful speech. Please join me.